good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to each one of you as you join us this afternoon for our seminar Psalms, Jewish Prayer and Christian Prayer to be presented uh, by Sister Mary Rayburn. This seminar is offered as part of the work of the Sisters of Our Lady of Sion, Australia region. And so to begin, I'm on the land originally inhabited by the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And as we gather, we pay our respects to the peoples who originally inhabited and cared for the various lands on which we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, as we work with them towards justice, peace, healing and reconciliation. Uh, shortly, Sister Mary Rayburn will offer the keynote address and following the presentation, there'll be a short time for you to move into a small discussion group in a breakout room. This will allow you some time to formulate questions and to have a short discussion about what's staying with you from the presentation this afternoon. Uh, again, I'll remind you that during the presentation, you will have your microphones muted just so that you're able to maintain a quiet space for us to enjoy the presentation. So just to introduce you to Sister Mary Rayburn. Uh, Sister Mary Rayburn, uh, Sister of Our Lady of Zion, Mary teaches at Yarra Theological Union within the University of Divinity. She loves the Psalms and wisdom literature and indeed the whole of the Bible. Her recent publication, A Friendly Guide to the Psalms, was published earlier this year and is available through Garrett Publishing. Mary is involved in the Jewish Christian relations in many local areas and beyond. And she's currently on the Australian Catholic Bishops Council for Ecumenical and Religious Relations with the Jews. She comes to us this afternoon with a wealth of knowledge and love of prayer through scripture and understanding of the Psalms. And so I invite you to join me in virtually welcoming you, Mary, to the screen and to sit back and enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much, Carmel. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for all the work you're doing behind the, the scenes too. It is a joy to um, speak a little about the Psalms, but there is so much to say that we won't get to say it all today. There is a second session in this series, which will be live, and Carmel will tell us about that later. So in some ways, the two uh, complement each other. I just want to begin with a, a short introduction, and it is always a joy for me to, um, to be with you, to be with you in so many parts. It's also a joy to be with you in terms of engagement with scripture in general, but in particular today with the Psalms, they are our focus. They are found in the Bible, well, they're found throughout the Bible, but we're talking today about the 150 Psalms that are collected in what we call the Book of Psalms or sometimes the Psalter. And they were composed over quite a long period of history in the life of the people of Israel. Most people think of an association with King David, and we date him around 1000 BCE. However, he certainly is not the composer of all the Psalms. And we see that some of them reflect the Babylonian exile, which was much later than David, 597 to 537. Some of them were used in the Second Temple period from 520 approximately BCE to 70 CE, 70 of the Common Era. So the book of Psalms, the Psalter, seems to have been stable by around 200 BCE when the influential translation into Greek, what we call the Septuagint, was probably made in Egypt. And I think we actually have a sister from Egypt with us tonight. There are some minor differences between the Hebrew text and the Greek text, but essentially they represent the same collection. Thus, by the time of Jesus, 
the collection of psalms is formed. The book in its, its basic elements is there. And we read in Luke 24, 44, where Jesus uh, is quoting that the law of Moses or the Torah of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And so we come to understand that in this context, the Psalms for Luke represents the whole of the third section of the Jewish Bible. So they're quite significant in terms of the, the canon of scripture by that time. So we see that the Psalms are composed over a long period. The Jewish people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, they are the ones who composed, preserved, and prayed the Psalms. The Jewish communities of today continue to pray the Psalms in synagogues, in their homes. And I have a beautiful memory of Jewish women at the Western Wall in Jerusalem praying the Psalms as their small children pull on their dress or amuse themselves. We Christians, because we arose from a Jewish context and because we follow a Jew Jewish Jesus who was raised by Jewish parents and went up to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, especially the pilgrim feasts of Passover, Shavuot and Sukkot, we therefore retained the Psalms as part of our tradition. Jesus and most of his followers were Jews and the Psalms were familiar to them and formed the context of their relationship with their own people, with their tradition, with their life, and especially with their God. This is a brief story of the Psalms. There are many details we do not know and there are many details that we do know. So we are praying poetry when we pray the Psalms and we're praying poetry that is well over 2000 years old. And on the whole, it still speaks to us. And if we wish, it will speak for us today. This is because they are human words from human experience addressed to God who is both familiar and close and other and awesome. Today, I'll focus on the grounding of the Psalms in life, yesterday in their origins and today, on the Psalms as prayer, on the fact that the Psalms are poetry and their connection with liturgy. I love these texts. They're human words to God and therefore prayer. And in that respect, um, we pray them. We pray them singly and we pray them together. We also accept them as scripture and therefore they are the word of God. And in that respect, they are God's gift to us and God's teaching to guide us to life. Life is the aim of worship and of prayer. Life in and from pain, life in and from joy. Very recently, Pope Francis said, we do not be, need to be afraid of our, our pain or um, to protect God from our pain in our prayer. And he was talking really about the book of Job, not the book of Psalms, but I'm sure he learned this very much from the Psalms. And he said that the book of, of Job represents um, the pain, especially when it seems to be excessive and unmerited, when pain and suffering befall individuals or families or a people. The Pope went on to say that God is not afraid of confrontation by us. And it's okay to speak clearly to God, if you like, to, prov to provoke God. The Pope reminded us that God will listen to you 
and God is not afraid of our prayers or our protests. So this, uh, this reminder, uh, and he spoke this yesterday, and I, I think it's so true. The, the Psalms teach us to speak honestly and directly to God and to speak our truth. So today we'll look at the Psalms as prayer and as liturgy. We'll look first at the ups and downs of life. We'll look at the Psalms as prayer, where we take these ups and downs of life to God, where we talk to God, where we dialogue with God, because we have a relationship there. And in real relationships, we speak, we dialogue, we engage each other. And the Psalms assist us in doing that. The Psalms are both in the singular and in the plural, and therefore um, can be seen as individual and communal. And the communal element, I think, is becoming more and more of a challenge for us today. Um, we're very aware of our individualism and our worth as an individual. And I think in our society, it's often the challenge of being part of a community and accepting uh, the limitations of that and the responsibilities of that and also the wonders of that. So liturgy is communal of its nature, both when we gather in person and I've put there when we gather virtually, and that can be true today on things like Zoom, but it's equally as true for the last hundreds and hundreds of years, when people pray the Psalms, and I think of this especially for uh, Catholics in terms of the prayer of the church, when we pray the prayer of the church, we are praying with all other prayers and with all other people. And we might be praying a lament Psalm that speaks of great pain, and yet we may be feeling wonderful ourselves but we're praying with those who are in pain. So the virtual community is not simply about being online, but that virtual community of our imagination that is a much wider community. The Jewish community continues to pray the Psalms. They prayed them in temple times, especially in the temple, but also in, in life and in the, the developing synagogues. And they continue to do that. Unfortunately, there is no temple, so they are no longer prayed in the temple. In the Christian community, we pray them as responsorial psalms, as the prayer of the church, maybe as Lexio Divina. We pray them when things are difficult and we pray them when things are marvelous. So the psalms give us words for our prayers. There are two main types of emotions, of expressions, of prayers that we come across in the Psalter. The most common, the most common genre are laments or petitions. And the other very common genre is the hymn, the hymn of praise, and it's relative, if you like, the Thanksgiving psalm. So, um, we, we, we know life in these two elements and we speak to God from these two things. And you'll notice that in the thumbs up, um, it's still going upwards. And in the, in the image of great suffering from the period of the Shoah, you know, the hands are going up to God. So in both circumstances, we seem to think of God as up there. We know theologically that's not the case, but that's how we're, we're almost programmed as human beings when in prayer to, to look towards God, to look up towards God. So the ups in life. There are psalms which give expression to high points in life and even to the good enough times in life. Psalm 136 is such a psalm. It begins, O oh, give thanks to the Lord. And here in the NRSV, the Lord represents the sacred name. 
So I've written it in there so that we can be reminded that it's God's particular name that is, is represented there in the text. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. And this psalm has for its refrain, for God's steadfast love endures forever. So the refrain forms the second half of every verse in this psalm. And by doing that, it sees God's steadfast love, God's chesed, as the foundation of everything for which the psalmist gives thanks. Psalm 96 begins, sing to the Lord a new song. And this is a wonderful way to give expression to new and exciting things that are happening in the lives of individuals or in the life of the community. So the Psalms offer expressions for the uptimes. And some of those uptimes are very precious moments. And the image reminds us of that. So Psalm, 40, uh, sorry, Psalm 34 set begins, I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. So it's not just all human beings, it's calling the whole earth, the whole of the created order to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And in that seeing self as part of that whole community of life the whole created order. Psalm 101 says, I will sing of loyalty and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing. So it's really praising God for instances of loyalty and justice. And Psalm 117 says, praise the Lord, all new nations. And how we wish we could pray that together in these days when there is so much unrest in our world. So the Psalms bring all of these precious moments to words, to our relationship with God. There are also down times and um, this image by the artist Ben, a French artist, says it all really. It's an image of the text that I have here. And it says, it's the text of Psalm 69, verse 12, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters. The floods sweep over me. And most of us know that experience, not so much literally, although the people in the southern Queensland and northern New South Wales have very recently known that very literally. Uh, but most of us also know it metaphorically or figuratively. To be overwhelmed, that we can't get our, our footing right. The floods are coming over us. So the Psalms depict this reality so vividly and so clearly. There are down times that are intense suffering. And we see from the images here something of that intense suffering. And Psalm 137, and Lots of people object to this verse of, of the psalm, but I think it's really important that it's, it's there, and it's not up to me whether it's there or not, but I think it gives voice to something. It makes us think about intense violence and our response to it. And so at the end of Psalm 137, it says, O daughter Babylon, you devastator, Happy shall they be who pay you back for what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against a rock. And many Christians say, we shouldn't be talking like that. 
However, I remind us all, myself included, that this is speaking to God. And that's the safest place. It's important that we know the, what we're experiencing, our emotions, what we're experiencing internally. And it's important to give expression to them. And the safest place to do that is to tell God about it. Not to go and act and do the thing, but to tell God how intensely you're feeling it. Because for this psalm, the people of Israel had been taken into exile in Babylon. They'd lost their temple, their king, their land, well, most had, had been taken from the land as captives. And so they, they were helpless to do this, but they were feeling it very strongly. And we see images similar today. I did hear a, a young um, Yugoslavian, uh, sorry, a, a young woman say the other day, I hate the Russians. And I felt sorry that she said it, but I could hear in terms of her people, the Ukrainian people, what, what had happened to them, why she was saying that. She wasn't going around acting on it, but she was giving expression. And so the Psalms invite us to, to give expressions to those very intense feelings, but to do it in the safest way by speaking it to God. There are also down moments which reflect abandonment, that feeling of being abandoned by God. And Psalm 22, which the evangelist puts on the lips of Jesus, has him speak these words too. But each of us have known moments of abandonment, of feeling forsaken. And so there will be times when we wish to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. And for me, the, the words that really touch me where um, God is far from the words of my groaning. God doesn't even seem to hear my words. You know, so that deep feeling of abandonment is another one of the great downs of life the difficult moments. So we've seen that many Psalms tell God how sad or how bad things are. We call them laments or petitions, and they ask God to change things. Surprisingly, they speak very forthrightly to God because they are speaking to a good and familiar friend. And so in Psalm 44, it says, all of this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. So we've been true God, but you don't seem to be keeping your side of the covenant. So the Psalms again and again and again teach us to speak our truth to God. Walter Brueggemann, a scholar who has written a lot on the Psalms, in his book, The Message of the Psalms, explores uh, Recur's idea of movements in life and applies them in a schematic way to the Psalms. And so he speaks of, in life, times of orientation, disorientation, which upsets the orientation, throws us into confusion, and then reorientation, which is sometimes called new orientation. And the reorientation is not going back to the original orientation. There's a newness in the reorientation. I found my way ahead after the turmoil of the disorientation, and I'm ready to go ahead 
but I'm different now to what I was before. So Brueggemann offers, offers us another way of looking at the Psalms in relation to our lives, to our very ordinary and our wonderful lives. So the Psalms are especially, not solely, but especially lament and praise. The most common genre, the most common type of Psalm is a lament, which give, gives expression to pain. It may be the pain of abandonment, of guilt, of violence, of defeat, of illness, of depression. The next most common genre is the hymn and its relation, the Psalm of Psalms of Thanksgiving. Thus, the highs and the lows um, of life offer us a way of taking these emotions to God. And I do like the, um, the poster there. If there are no ups and downs in your life, then you're dead. Um, it, ups and downs are ordinary parts of life. The Psalms perhaps represent the more extremes, ups and downs, but we can pray them at any time. So Psalms are prayers, not all of them, but many of them. In the simplest form of prayer, it's talking to God. So they are addressed, many of them addressed to God and they speak the truth to God, the truth of joy and gratitude and the truth of, pray, of pain, incomprehension, abandonment and guilt. So they speak the truth as we are on the path of life. And we'll see later that Psalm 1, in many ways, invites us into the path of life. So what does it mean to say that Psalms are prayers? It means at its simplest level that they are addressed or many of them are addressed to God. It also means that we are presuming that there is a God who listens. And that's an important presumption. God is important in my life. I am presuming that God is listening to my prayers. Our prayers may reveal something about me or you or us as prayers, and they will also reveal something of the God who is addressed in those prayers. Sometimes they are in a single voice, other times in a plural voice, and it can even be collective so that they, the individual voice can stand for the whole community. Does it mean that prayer is always about speaking? No, it certainly doesn't mean that. There are times when in prayer we commune. There are times when in prayer we absolutely have no voice. And the Psalms can give us words when we have no voice, no words. Does it mean that there's only one way to pray? No, the Psalms even offer differing ways to pray, and there are many ways beyond that. Does it mean that God can only be viewed or experienced in one way? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that these texts cannot also be understood as word of God? No, it doesn't. But if we see them as God's word, then they are a gift to us. If we see them as prayers, then they're our words to God. And I think both things are true. Do we always have to pray as a community? No. Do we always have to pray as an individual? No. Both are important. It's also important to remember that Psalms are poetry. So they're made up of words and symbols, metaphors. They come from deep experience of life and they often convey deeper meanings. As poetry, in terms of the words, they're often very brief. They use few words so that the listener or the reader 
can fill the gaps and allow a dialogue between the life of the prayer and the life and the poetry itself. So we enter into a dialogue with the poetry, even as we pray it. The Psalms as biblical poetry or Hebrew poetry also have a lot of repetition. And one of those, and we'll, we'll note a little more about it in a minute, is parallelism. So that in a verse, uh, there are two halves normally of a verse, and it, it seems to repeat itself often. We also see that words, especially important words, are repeated. And in English, that's not good English writing, but in, in the Psalms and in, in biblical Hebrew, it's, it gives emphasis. It's a way of, of ensuring that what is being said is really heard both by the prayer and ultimately our desire is that God will hear it. So when we talk about repetition in the poetry of the Psalms, um, the, first of all, as we look at our Bible, we can see from the setting, the way the Bibles are printed today, the setting usually indicates just visually that it's poetry that we're reading. But one very common element of biblical poetry is this repetition that I spoke about. And so we have what we call synonymous repetition. And one example is Psalm 22, verse 9, which says, Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. And in a little while, we'll look at one of the metaphors as God as midwife. And this psalm is, is one of the psalms that speaks of God, uses the metaphor of midwife to speak of God. And it repeats itself. Yet it was you, God, you the midwife, who took me from, from the womb. You, God, you midwife, kept me safe on my mother's breast. So it's almost saying the same thing, but usually the second half intensifies it. And that's what's happening here. Not only is God depicted as receiving the newborn child from the womb, but he's also the one who places that child on the mother's breast. And that's what ensures that life continues, the life of the newborn child. In um, contrasting parallelism, we get uh, something similar, um, but it, it's also very different. So Psalm 34 verse 10 says, the young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So it's contrasting the young, li young lions, you know, the things that roar, the young lions, their suffering want, but those who trust in God lack no good thing. So it's making the point there by contrast, just in the one verse. There are also refrains that are repeated in Hebrew poetry. And when we looked at Psalm 136 at the beginning, we, we noted that the refrain there is the second half of every verse. That's the most developed use of refrains. But there are other refrains that we come across in the Psalms. And there are words and images that are repeated. And sometimes we also uh, get an interplay between the verses. So. There is a lot of repetition and well-used repetition in the Psalms. It's part of the poetry. It's part of the beauty of the Psalms. Robert Elter, a Jewish scholar, in his book, The Art of Biblical Poetry, says that, and he's speaking here of um, biblical poetry, poetry is the best words in the best order. 
Now, unfortunately, most of us are reading the Psalms in translation, so we don't get um, always the, the order of the words, but we do, we do get a sense of the words and the sparseness in the words. Elter also says that Hebrew poetry is characterized by compactness, that brevity that I talked about. It doesn't use a lot of words, and so it engages our experience and our imagination as we dialogue with the poetry to unpack its meaning. And then he talks about the repetition, which I have mentioned, the repetition of meaning in the parallelism, but also there's repetition of, of the verbs and the subjects and the objects that, that we see there. Unfortunately, some of that is invisible in translation. So I encourage you all to learn Hebrew and to read the Psalms in their original language. Here, I want to just look briefly at metaphors that abound in the Psalms. And this, uh, we know that really right back since the time of Aristotle, countless philosophers, literary theorists, poets have attempted to discern how the metaphor produces something fresh. In light of its Greek root metaphor, um, it, it denoted um, transfer of property initially, and now it's transfer of meaning. And most modern definitions of metaphor include two elements that establish a correspondence or congruity. So Soskit's definition is as good as any. The metaphor, that figure of speech, whereby we speak about one thing in terms that are suggestive of another. The scholar Brown holds that similes are a form of metaphor. So if we use a metaphor, we say God is a rock. If we use a simile, we say God is like a rock. Brown quotes Dodd, who captures well the impact on the reader of the metaphor. And Dodd says, a metaphor or simile draw from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its precise application to tease it into, to tease the mind into active thought. So in a way, metaphors are playing with our mind, not as some of our um, present day media tries to do, not to manipulate our mind, but to tease it into active thought. And that's what's happening in the metaphors that we encounter in the, in the Psalms. Brown does suggest though, that if we absolutize a metaphor, we make it an idol. So I can say God is a rock, but if I absolutize that, I might begin to worship the rock and forget about God for whom it is a metaphor. So we need to guard against literalizing metaphors. And in our society, we are awash with images which are intended really to shape our thinking. And so that idea of the act of thought is so very important. We have to engage with those images. If you like, we have to critique them. We have to engage with them and think about it. And that way we're not manipulated, but we are able to, uh, to make our own decisions, to engage with them, to understand them. So that to read and to read metaphors theologically is in part to linger over the metaphor, to engage with it, to really plumb the depth of its meaning. I just want to take two metaphors for God that we find in the Bible, and I mentioned them briefly earlier. The first is midwife, and I choose this metaphor because it's not so often that we have um, 
images taken from the female experience that are used to describe God. We, both, we all know that God is neither male nor female, but biblically we talk about God in a lot more male metaphors. So here is one midwife, and it's used in Psalm 22 and Psalm 71 to speak of God. And so I'll just read you from Psalm 22 again. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. So God depicted there as midwife. And then in Psalm 71, verse 6, it says, Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. So that's a beautiful image of God receiving the child at birth and being the, the one, the medium, who places the child in the mother's arms to allow the child to be nurtured from the mother's breast. The other image, so the, the image in the tan is an ancient image of midwife. And then we have a modern image of midwife. And both are important. They're so important today. It's the vulnerability of the newborn child which touches us too. And in, in that use in seeing God as the midwife, we are in some ways seeing ourselves as very vulnerable. Literally, the umbilical cord must be cut. The mother needs some help. The baby needs help even to reach the mother's breast. So God is the one facilitating all of that, always for the sake of life here, both literally, but also metaphorically and physically. The other metaphor I, I want to touch on briefly is that of shepherd and in Psalm 23 and in Psalm 80, we have it. And Psalm 23 is very familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pasture and leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. God leads me in right paths for God's name's sake. And then in Psalm 80, it addresses God, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. So the image there of shepherd, a familiar image, especially familiar in biblical times. That image was then used of the king who was supposed to be like the shepherd, caring for the people. And ultimately, the image is used of God who is also understood as a shepherd caring for the sheep. As Pope Francis likes to remind us, the smelly sheep. But caring for the sheep, ensuring life for the sheep. Just to move along a little, we're reminded that the Psalms are not only personal, but also communal. In biblical times, the individual is very aware of being a member of the community, a member of their people. I think today we're not quite so aware of that. We're much more aware of myself as an individual rather than myself as a member of community. But then both were important and now both are important. And so the prayer of the individual and the prayer of the community was in the past deeply in interconnected. And today it needs to be deeply interconnected because that's how we get liturgy. Our liturgy needs 
to give expression, simple and clear expression to what the community is experiencing. And that's true today and was true in the time of the Psalms. And Psalms can certainly help us to give expression in liturgy so that it connects with our life because liturgy is always aimed at giving life. The title of this talk was about prayer, Jewish and Christian communities. And on the 7th of September, you will receive a notice, or for the 7th of September, you will receive a notice about another presentation by a Jewish scholar and a Christian scholar on Psalms in liturgy, and it will emphasize this element even more particularly. Here we have an image of the model of the temple in Jerusalem, the second temple, which was the temple in Jesus' time and the temple which was destroyed by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era. Many of the Psalms were composed for use, some maybe for the first temple and certainly were used in the second temple. So they are in their origins, many of them, they are the words that accompany the liturgy. So in their history, they are connected with liturgy. They were most probably chanted, and it's in the chanting, in the familiarity, in the repetition that comes there, that we see um, they give the community a voice towards God. So psalms were composed to be used in the liturgy of the temple. Some may be the first temple, many for the second temple, and especially for the three pilgrim feasts, not only, but especially for the three pilgrim feasts, the feast of Passover, the feast of Shavuot, which is sometimes called Pentecost, and for the Christians here, when the Acts of the Apostles speaks of the Feast of Pentecost, it's not talking about our feast, although it is in that context, it's talking about the Jewish Feast of Shavuot. And then the third of the pilgrim feasts was the Feast of Sukkot, sometimes called the Feast of Tents or Tabernacles. They're the three pilgrim feasts where Jewish people who possibly could were to go up to Jerusalem. So that's some of the origin of the Psalms. But they're also used in, in historically, they were used in the synagogues, which were developing um, towards the time of the destruction of the temple and became then much, much more central after the destruction of the temple. They're used in the wider family community and used personally. In 70 of the common era, the temple was destroyed by the Romans and the Jewish community continued to pray the Psalms. The Christian community, which is forming at that stage, also because the Christian community comes out of the context of Judaism, they also continue to pray the Psalms. And so we have, even today, both communities using the Psalms in their liturgy. When we look at the Psalms, both Jews and Christians look at the Psalms today, there are many individuals and communities which experience joy and pain. And when we look towards our wider world, we can pray with and for those, for those in pain in Afghanistan, in the Ukraine, in Yemen, in Australia, in the areas where there have been floods and fires and so many other things that cause deep pain. So that communities um, can offer a good, loud, collective lament to God about the pain. Or they can sing a great song of praise together. 
And in a way, that's the foundation of our liturgy, coming together in our collective pain or our collective joy. So for Jews and for Christians, the Psalms are a means of lamenting and praising, both individually and especially together. That doesn't mean that others cannot do similar things, but we share this common um, heritage. Jews and Christians share the Psalms historically, but sadly, in a way, we seldom pray them together and we seldom pray them together for the sake of the wider community. It's important for Christians, and Catholics in particular, to remember that in 2001, the Catholic Pontifical Biblical Commission wrote a document, a long document, which reminds Catholics of how indebted we are to Judaism in terms of our scriptures, and it recommends that we benefit from Jewish scholarship in terms of our Christian study of the scriptures in general and in tonight's context, the Psalms in particular. One thing that we share in common, Jews and Christians, is a concern for our wider earth community. And there are three Psalms, Psalm 8, 19, and 104, which are often called creation Psalms. Um, and they, they speak, but they are praising the creator. They're all hymns. Each of those is a hymn, praising God as creator. And maybe today the anomaly is that we need to also lament about our created order because of the way it is deteriorating. So just to remind us that God is the creator of all. So Psalms are essentially relational, many of them addressed to God and therefore prayers. They are in a way essentially communal and they give expression to a range of emotions. Psalm 1 suggests that the person who delights in God and meditates on God's Torah day and night will be happy. And it's the first psalm. And from its position there, it indicates that perhaps we should read the Psalter, the book of Psalms, as Torah, as God's teachings. So let's just look briefly at Psalm 1. It's the first psalm and it serves as an introduction to the whole Psalter. And by being an introduction, it suggests that all the psalms are to be read as Torah. God's teaching to us about life and for life. It also, Psalm 1, also suggests that life is about choices. And so Psalm 1 reads, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the Torah of the Lord, and on God's Torah they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way or path of the righteous, but the way or path of the wicked will perish. And so that psalm is saying to us, do you want to be chaff? Or do you want to be a tree planted with good roots beside water? I have taken the liberty of using an Australian gum tree there, which, well, does bear fruit, but not fruit that we eat. Um, but that's the choice this psalm is inviting us to make. And so when we come to Psalm 1 and to the whole Psalter, because it's the introduction, we come seeking righteousness. And we look at the way we are with each other and with all of creation. We come in order to bear fruit, or that's the challenge that 
the psalm invites us to, to bear fruit for our communities and our world. The psalm invites us to listen ultimately to God's gracious teachings, God's Torah. We come with Psalm 1 to pray that our work together will produce fruit, happiness, righteousness. And we come to know our God. I just want to take, and I, I will finish in a couple of minutes, but I just want to also look at an example of a lament. Psalm 13, an individual lament. Its heading in the Hebrew is to the leader, a psalm of David. The psalm begins, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death and my enemy will say I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in you. I will sing to the Lord who has dealt bountifully with me. So this lament, we don't really know what the problem is, but we get a sense that enemies are at least part of the problem. Enemies have something to do with what, with the suffering of the psalmist. And we have to ask ourselves, who do you think of as enemies? Is it other people? Is it cancer? Is it climate change? Is it depression or oppression? Is it modern slavery? It's, is it war? So we have to engage with it. You know, we're activating our mind as these metaphors there. We note the questions in it. Four times, how long, how long, O oh Lord? the questions there and the repetition of them. Note the relationship because the psalm asks God to consider and note the trust in the, in the past, uh, the trust in the present, in the pain, and the trust in the future that I will sing And then finally, just to share with you the shortest psalm, which is also universal, it's marvellous. It says, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol God, all you peoples, for great is God's steadfast love towards us and the faithfulness of the Lord will endure. Praise the Lord, which in Hebrew is Alleluia. So that psalm, a, a way of giving expression and calling the whole earth to join in praising our God. And why are we praising God? For God's steadfast love towards us, for God's faithfulness towards us, us as, as a people, us as a race. And so with that, I will conclude, and I think Carmel is going to invite us into groups now. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. So I invite you just to take a quiet moment now, just to reflect on Mary's presentation, and in particular, what's staying with you right now as you reflect back over those words, over our exploration of the genre, and over the beautiful psalms that Mary shared with us towards the end there. Uh, Mary, this one's just come through asking, uh, would there be an opportunity ever to join Jews and Christian believers to pray the Psalms together? Would you like to comment on that at all? I don't know. It would depend on, on the local community and if they chose to come together to pray, especially maybe at a time of um, either great joy or great sorrow for the community, maybe the local community. But I do think the Psalms could offer that. I know in Australia, we've had serious bushfires and serious floods quite recently. 
Um, I know throughout our whole world, we've had COVID, which has touched and changed and you know, often damaged so many lives. But there are, there are world events, there are local events that could provide that opportunity, but it's whether or not we make the choice to do that. They are, however, words that we hold in common in our tradition. Um, and praying together, we always have to be cautious and careful that we don't impede upon each other's traditions. But the Psalms are something that we hold together. So they, they do offer Jews and Christians um, something in common there. Mm. Thank you. A couple of people from their breakout groups expressing their sincere gratitude, which we'll thank you a little bit more formally shortly, Mary. So just to um, let you know that. Uh, someone, a couple of people are asking about um, how much we're missing out on uh, by not being able to read the Psalms in Hebrew and a particular question about whether there's a translation that helps bring out the Hebrew meanings of the metaphors more more closely perhaps than uh, the ones that we might generally read. Okay. It, firstly, it's often good to read different translations. Um, I think for Christians to read a translation by a Jewish scholar can be really uh, helpful and important. And Robert Alter has done a translation where he tries to highlight the poetic nature of the text um, and he does that well, and occasionally you sort of it's it becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, so that is one uh, one way to do it. But even just to read different translations gives us different insights into the text. The best thing would be to learn Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and read them uh, themselves. But you lose some of the brevity because Hebrew can be a very brief language with prefixes and suffixes. So you lose some of the intensity that the brevity helps create. And you lose some of the diversity of meanings because the Hebrew can have a whole range of meanings. And in order to translate it into English, you have to choose one of that, one mm -hmm. avenue of meaning to go there. So yes, but reading different translations is a good way to begin. Thank you, Mary. Uh, there's a question here asking, um, besides referencing certain historical events, is there a way to date specific psalms, such as using expression or style of vocabulary, about dating the psalms? Dating the psalms is very difficult um, because they are poetry in lots of ways. That makes them more difficult. Uh, there are some, like the one I mentioned, Psalm 137, which uh, speaks about the Babylonian exile. So that gives us some indication of dating. Um, then the question arises, was it written during the exile or after the exile? You know, is it a reflection upon that experience or is it an expression of that experience? So dating the Psalms is, is very difficult. Sometimes it's the nature of the Hebrew language because Hebrew has changed over time, as we know with English, it's, it's changed over time. So sometimes the language gives us a clue whether it's archaic Hebrew or more uh, the normative biblical Hebrew. But then you have to say, well, did the scholar use deliberately use archaic Hebrew in order to, to suggest something? So it's, it is a difficult area. Um, and I think they are universal, uh, not just in terms of geography, but universal in terms of time. And it's, it's because, so that timelessness is an, a, a real value for the Psalms. It's not, it is a hindrance that we can't date them specifically, but it's also a, a value in, the fact that they're written more than 2,000 years ago, but they can resonate with my or our experience today. So that's, it's one of the difficulties and it's part of their beauty. And thank you, Mary, for uh, in there 
feedback from their group have pointed that out too. Uh, one comment, we really enjoyed linking, we really enjoy linking the Psalms to when students learn poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, uh, just in uh, reference to your explanation about Brueggemann there in the movement to life, um, just asking how can we use, it's kind of a rhetorical question really, isn't it? How can we use Psalms to help or teach young people in our Catholic schools today to be real and to be their true selves? How do teachers better embrace the beauty of the Psalms? And I, I suspect that's the, the stuff of an entire presentation of its own, but you certainly offered us insights into how to use them in all their realness and ups and downs of life this evening. Um, and, and I think that's what young people want. They want to be genuine and the Psalms are genuine. And so they can be a, a great mechanism in that regard. Yeah. Just a, a further comment about that uh, from one of our people, I presume a teacher, saying young adults today are really into slam poetry, which has so many connections with the Psalms. Would Psalms be taught more in primary and secondary schools with a focus on these connections? So again, uh, just uh, reminding us that in every era, people mm. teach, turn to poets to help them express what's going on in their lives. So again, Absolutely true. An English teacher said to me one day, when I, I hear that psalm, I think about Shakespeare's sonnets. And I said to her, well, where did Shakespeare learn his language from? One of the, the prime sources of his language formation, and that is the Bible. So, um, yes, the poetry and, and biblical poetry is wonderful in that regard. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, we probably need to start mm -hmm. wrapping up tonight. People have been very patient and very attentive. Uh, Mary, there's one here that I do not actually expect you to comment on, but a question about whether there's a psalm that can help us work out who to vote for in Saturday's election. <laughs> we, we won't be trying to comment on that, perhaps. We might leave no. it. At... No, no. So I'd thank like, you. Everybody. I'd like to hear their answer. Yeah, perhaps they could uh, feed it back to us rather than the other way around if something's given them inspiration. So just as we uh, wrap up our session tonight, to thank you, Mary, most sincerely for your time and your effort, your expertise and your passion and energy this evening. Um, as we've seen in, in the comments and in your own presentation, the Psalms remind us that our relationship with God is based in truth and life and give voice to this reality the reality that our lives are full of joy and beauty and praise and wonder and at other times full of need and desire, anger, longing and, of course, lament. So, Mary, again, our thanks and we'll give you the virtual but rather than a, a big loud one just to most sincerely thank you for your presentation this evening and for your inspiring work around our psalm. I'd also like just to thank all those who assisted in organising tonight's seminar. It is part of the work of the Sisters of Our Lady of Sion Australia region and in particular uh, the Jewish Christian Relations team. So again, thank you to all of those people for helping us put together tonight's presentation and seminar. A special thanks to Mark Walsh, who's been our tireless uh, tech advice and back up there all evening. So Mark, we really appreciate that. That makes it much easier uh, for the rest of us to get on and do what we're doing. Our sincere thanks to Garrett Publishing for their promotion of this event and also for their uh, publication of Mary's book, A Friendly Guide to the Psalms, of Psalms uh, which of course, if you're interested, is available from Garrett Publishing at the moment. Uh, also, just to let you know, the recording of this session will be uploaded to our YouTube channel tomorrow. Our details were sent to you in the uh, link to this seminar. Uh, however, you could uh, find us uh, by Googling Sisters of Our Lady of the Zion Australia, and we encourage you to like, to comment, to share our YouTube channel, where you'll also find some other past uh, webinars that we've been able to offer you. And uh, finally, to just uh, give you some further details, Mary spoke about this briefly in her own presentation, 
save the date really for Sunday the 11th of September where the Jewish Christian Relations team are delighted to be able to host Rabbi Fred Morgan and Dr. Meryl Blair in a dialogue with the Psalms and with one another. So as Mary said, it is really, uh, if you like, a follow-up event to the one we've offered this evening, which was really uh, an excellent background and foundation for the idea of the Psalms being Jewish prayer and Christian prayer. So thank you everyone, enjoy your evening and